When Russell Westbrook entered his name into the 2008 NBA draft class, the depiction of who he was as a player looked to be pretty different from what he'd end up becoming. After a sophomore season at UCLA that saw him named the Pac-10 Defensive Player of the Year, he was viewed as a defensive-minded prospect, a 6'3 guard who could play up a position because of his freakish athleticism and devastating length, which ultimately earned him the title of prototypical lockdown defender. Offensively, he had his strengths. Of course, the explosive athleticism made him a nightmare to contain in the open floor, and he was a threat to get to the rim at any given moment. But it's the more traditional point guard skills that many questioned. He was thought of as a solid or even good passer, but left some to be desired, and it was said that he struggled dealing with ball pressure, wasn't capable of making tough decisions consistently, so projecting him to be an initiator almost didn't feel right. As a result, instead of a true point guard, he was compared to the likes of a Dwayne Wade, a small two, combo guard, and because he wasn't a full-time PG in college, nobody knew how that would translate to the next level. Of course, by his second NBA season, he was averaging 8 assists on a 50-win team and would go on to produce some of the greatest volume shot creation campaigns the league has ever seen, so I think it turned out alright. When Russ took that leap as a playmaker, it became his new playstyle. Scratch everything you thought you knew about him coming into the league, because now he was dominating the ball, spamming pick and roll to get everyone on his team wide open shots, and added a really nice mid-range game to complement that world-class slashing. But all good things must come to an end, and as the athleticism started to taper off as he left his prime years, so did a lot of these valuable traits. He was never a high-touch player to begin with, and I'm not sure if it's the weight and muscle gain, but that dropped to an entirely different level. The mid-range pull-up and his free-throw shooting fell off a cliff, and he could no longer finish through the trees with the same effectiveness. That wouldn't be much of a problem, except his role on the team and tendencies as an attacker didn't adapt with this decline, so he ended up turning into one of those guys who gets talked about as someone who can put up numbers, but isn't really impacting the team in a positive way. And in his time on the Lakers, this looked to be the case. But when he was moved to the Clippers, we saw a shift in his role on both ends of the floor, taking on new duties, or should I say old habits. What we saw during those 26 games was a glimpse into the past. This is who he was projected to be out of UCLA, except now he could pair that with a few more of those developed skills, and it might just be how he spends the twilight years of his career. Defensively, it was his energy and activity that jumped off the screen making plays through overly aggressive pressure, and just making life as difficult as possible for whoever he was matched up with. It starts away from the ball. Durant wants to set up on the wing, and Russ makes getting him the ball nearly impossible. But because he was so aggressive in the passing lane, now he's behind the play. No problem, because he'll just chase KD down and obliterate his pull-up jumper. He's so good at making plays from behind like this, that he's almost intentionally letting ball handlers get in front of him so that he can chase them down in rear pursuit. This is a style of defense that's most infamously used by Matisse Thibel. It's ridiculously chaotic, but because of Westbrook's length and athleticism, he can play this game of chase and win. It's the exact same thing around screens. He angles his body in a way that gives Booker a free driving lane to his left, but when he instead rejects it and attacks right, Rush changes directions to start that game of chase, and sends a layup into the crowd. It's not just these superhuman chase down blocks, but he'll also constantly poke at the ball and hunt for steals. Durant's a good 2 or 3 feet in front of him, but that burst is just something else. Intentionally playing out of position has its drawbacks though. Sometimes it can make it easier for guys to get to their spots, and you're not always going to be able to get a hand on the ball. This can lead to overzealousness, or trying so hard to get back in the play that it results in a mistake, this time sending Durant to the free throw line on what would have been a really tough shot regardless. 
It also makes it a lot more difficult to contain dribble penetration, putting your body in a much more vulnerable position to be blown by for easy offense at the rim, and to make up for that, it forces the rest of the defense to play out of position as they have to rotate down to the paint more than they typically would, and that can lead to high quality offense elsewhere. For all of the negatives though, you could also argue that this high risk, high reward style of defense sets up higher leverage plays that wouldn't otherwise be there, like this game ceiling block and out of bounds save to snag a win in the series opener. Away from the ball, he did a lot of the same things. Zubots overhelps on the baseline and that leaves Aiton wide open for a freebie in the middle of the floor, so Westbrook rotates down from the top of the key to save two points. Here's another example, Chris Paul sets up the timeless pick and roll that pretty much always leads to a good shot, and what's so fascinating to me is that if Westbrook made a normal rotation to the nail, it would have left KD with some space one pass away, but because he's late to arrive, Paul thinks he has a mid-range jumper that again gets sent straight to the crowd. This time he starts in the corner matched up with Devin Booker as Phoenix looks to set up their offense through Durant on the elbow. And because KD's facing the top of the key, Russ takes a big risk by darting to the ball and the result is a turnover that turns into some real easy offense going the other way. I do still question Westbrook's IQ in these spots at times. His positioning and rotations can raise some question marks. His switches aren't always on point, but for the most part, what we saw in these five games was just a ridiculous defensive playmaker. He averaged 1.2 steals, 2.4 deflections, and 1.4 blocks. And I'd love to see him lean into that Matisse, I'm gonna chase you down and there's nothing you can do about it, defensive role a bit more. The Clippers have the facilities to put out lineups with him as the number four option, so a higher energy level unlocks this type of defensive activity, and that has some serious value. As for the offensive side of things, the Kawhi injury shifted him into more of a primary role, but he was probably off ball and spotting up more than we've ever seen him, which especially with Paul George coming back, I'd expect to be even more prominent. The obvious question is, how can he add value away from the ball if his weak outside shooting hurts the spacing so much? And it's absolutely true that you'll find possessions where his lack of outside threat hurts the offense. On this one, Booker doesn't even make an effort to pick up Russ on the perimeter, staying attached to Zubots down low, and that allows Ayton to double Norman Powell in the paint. Powell doesn't even think to hit Russ despite him standing on an island, and all of a sudden the shot quality on that possession has plummeted. A lot of people will tell you that to counteract this, Westbrook has to shoot the open shot and keep the defense honest, because if not, they'll just continue abandoning him. That's exactly what the defense wants him to do. Even if he can make them pay every now and then, and can get hot, that's not what matters, because the reality is that these possessions aren't producing positive value. Since 2021, he's hit just 33% of his wide open threes, landing him in the 16th percentile. Just for some better perspective, his wide open threes have an expected value of 0.99 points per attempt. The Charlotte Hornets had the worst half court offense in the NBA at 0.96. So in essence, a wide open three from Russ is basically a possession from the league's worst half court offense. And that's not even getting into the three pointers that'll shoot with a hand in his face early in the clock with a higher degree of difficulty regardless of reason. The answer is not pulling the trigger and hoping for the best. So if the defense just straight up isn't going to guard a player and shooting the open three is almost always a bad decision, how can they still make an impact? One way is through high energy and active movement away from the ball, punishing the defense for falling asleep. And Westbrook was able to do this by crashing the offensive glass. He averaged just under two offensive rebounds a game, and second chance offense is as efficient as it gets because the defense is out of position, forced into a scramble, and the result is often a wide open shot. Another way to punish unattentive off-ball defense is with quick decision making off the catch, using the space he's given to explode into a driving lane. 
Eric Gordon comes off a curl screen, and his shooting threat draws help from Booker just one pass away. So when it gets swung to Russ, instead of settling for three, he's gonna burst into a drive. And just like that, he's got an easy two points. Now, he didn't recognize and capitalize on all of these opportunities. Here's a real similar situation to the last one, with Paul closing out from his inside hip, and no helper in position to shut off the paint, but without hesitation, he just steps into a jumper. He ended the series at about 5.5 three-point attempts per game, which is obviously way too much, but I think he was hunting out driving lanes more times than not, and that's what you want to see. One might point to his lack of touch as a finisher as pushback for these being good possessions, but that fails to account for how much more efficient offense is at the rim. The league average for field goal percentage at the rim last year was 66.8, and Westbrook shot 58.8. That's 8% below average, a pretty egregious mark. But a 58.8% two-pointer is still producing almost 1.18 points per shot. The best half-court offense in the NBA produced 1.09. Compare that number to the 0.99 from 3, and what you want should be more than obvious. Because these are such high-value looks, the defense is always going to rotate to take them away, no matter what your field goal percentage is, which then frees up shooters for kickout passes, and just like that, you've turned Westbrook getting disregarded into an open three for a 40% shooter. It's the exact same thing when he has the ball. The defense is almost always going to give him space at the point of attack, and how he responds with decision making can ultimately decide whether it's a good possession or not. I mentioned the three-point shooting, again, he can get hot and catch a rhythm, but generally you don't want him taking these. But even those looks are so much better than the mid-range. Rush shot 36% from mid-range, 18th percentile. And remember the 1.18 points per shot at the rim, or 0.99 from 3? Those attempts are generating 0.72. Again, 0.96 was the worst half-court offense, and a lot of these shots are coming early in the clock or in transition, so they're just disastrous attempts. Thankfully, he's been cutting a lot of these out of his shot diet, for the most part, and that's a big step towards some more efficient scoring. What you want to see from him is instead of playing into the hands of the defense and settling for those shots, exploit that space he's given to create a driving lane. He's one month away from turning 35, yet still has all of the athletic tools to make this work. First is the burst. It's nearly impossible to give a guy that much room to operate and slide in front of his initial attack angle. And even if a defender is quick to close off the first attack, then he's got the sharp change of direction, rerouting into another lane that earns him a pair of free throws. So you've got the burst the change of direction, and he's also a ridiculously strong perimeter player. If he gets cut off, he can drop a shoulder into his defender's chest, just bullying his way to the front of the basket with force. It may sound unorthodox, but there's absolutely such a thing as attacking the rim too much, and you don't want him forcing the issue when there's no opportunity, but I think in that series, he landed on a pretty healthy balance for the most part, averaging just under 20 drives a game, most of which resulted in him getting all the way to the cup. Because he can be so lethal at exploiting space, I think there are still spots where you can have him initiating with the ball and he'll exert value, first being an early offense where he just puts so much pressure on the rim. Again, he can finish or spray it out to shooters with precision, so he's a pretty big threat when he gets going downhill. The Clippers made an effort to get him downhill as much as possible. This time, it's a little two-man action with Kawhi entering the ball to the elbow and darting into a handoff that serves as a down screen. And because KD doesn't want to leave the claw, that leaves Russ with a wide open lane. Most commonly though, it was an immediate ball screen in the middle of the floor, and this kind of serves as a roadblock, giving him a runway to the basket. Because of the explosive athleticism, it's not just him running off the screen you have to worry about, but also him rejecting it, and it all happens so fast that if you guess wrong, there's no recovering. 
In a way, these early ball screen actions apply similar pressure to a traditional pick and roll, and it's a way for him to draw extra attention without having the pull-up shooting threat, where he of course can punish any coverage as a playmaker. I think it goes without saying, but I'd feel wrong not at least mentioning it, he's still a big time machine in transition. It's the same thing, he's either getting to the rim or freeing up a teammate. In a slower paced, half court setting, he's very limited as a scorer, but he's still one of the best passers in the NBA. So to utilize that skill, the Clippers would set him up at the top of the key or on the wing from a standstill and have him initiate off ball actions as a passer. This is similar to what you'll see from a Draymond type in the Warriors offense, and it forces Westbrook's defender to pressure the ball so that he can't see everything that's happening. The problem then becomes his ability to anticipate openings and precisely place the ball. If the defense makes any sort of error, he'll take advantage and create wide open layups. Because he's limited as a scorer, but is still such a unique physical specimen, I do still think you can squeeze a little value out of his on-ball, half-court scoring, and that's through his ability to attack mismatches. He can take smaller guys in the post, where he's just so physical that when paired with his strength, allows him to create high-quality opportunities at the rim pretty consistently. And because of that, defenses are often forced to shift and offer a second body for when he sheds that mismatch, and that just opens up more playmaking. Another thing he's a threat to do in the post is generate separation for short turnaround jumpers. Although, like the mid-range pull-up, I think he can fall in love with the shot a bit too much at times, and it's probably better when he hunts for better looks. So, just to recap, for all of Westbrook's flaws, I think his short stint as a Clipper actually showed us a lot about how his role can develop into that of an impact player. Defensively, it's the aggression, devastating playmaking in rear pursuit, and overall high energy as he leans into his athletic tools. Offensively, it'll still take some trimming of the fat in weeding out some of those mid-range and three-point attempts, but if you get him off the ball and he's looking to pressure the rim, whether that's through offensive rebounding or slashing off the catch, that's a great way to keep the defense in rotation after a primary scorer like Kawhi or PG draws some extra attention. He can play on the ball, but in specific spots, like early in the offense, as a standstill passing hub, or if he has a mismatch to attack. It's important to remember that the Kawhi injury kind of forced him into more of a ball dominant role, but I think he showcased some really nice complementary skills to keep an eye on for the upcoming season, and we'll see if Westbrook can shape his game around these principles to add value to a competitive Clippers team. If you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn my post notifications on to be first on more content. If you're interested in my more in-depth research, make sure to check out my website and social media profiles. You can find those links in the description. Feel free to let me know down in the comments what you think of Westbrook. As always, I hope you all have a great day, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.